folks. Dr. Ken Berry here. Uh, if we've never met before, I am a family physician. I've been practicing family medicine for 21 years now. Uh, and I'm going live for the next hour, roughly, to answer as many questions as I can on YouTube, on Instagram, and on TikTok. I'm live on all three right now. There are people all over the world suffering from obesity, prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, fatty pancreas, fatty tongue. Yeah, that's, that's a real thing. And the only way they're ever going to reverse these chronic conditions, there's two ways. They can either starve themselves for the rest of their life, which that's not fun. Nobody wants to do that. Or they can adopt what I've come to call a proper human diet, which means a very low carbohydrate diet, very nutrient dense diet, a very uninflammatory diet, and a diet that's ancestrally appropriate that human beings have been eating for a long damn time. Okay. And when I say a long time, I don't mean a hundred years or a thousand years. Those are drops in the bucket. When you look at paleoanthropological time, those are a, a blink of the eye. I'm talking about 20,000 years, 50,000 years, 2 million years. This is the time frame. When I say a long damn time, that's what I mean. And so if any diet out there can say that people, human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, have been eating that diet for 2 million years, then I will stand down and shut up and go back and work on the farm and leave you guys alone. But I don't think anybody can say that, but we know quite clearly from the paleoanthropological research that human beings have been what's called a super carnivore, which means 70% of the food they ingested was in the form of animal products. That is a proper human diet. And so uh, it's, it's really unarguable when you talk about it on that time scale. Now, if you want to talk about the last 100 years, then we've been, been eating lots of sugar and grains and vegetable seed oils. Oh, wait, that's the same amount of time we've been getting progressively sicker and fatter, isn't it? Yeah. OK, so uh, I'm off my soapbox now. I'm ready to answer some questions. Uh, I, I've got a, a three good ones. Somebody said that uh, there's a new PLOS study out that says that you can add 10 years to your life by adding lots of legumes, that's beans, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits to your diet, and eliminating meat and processed meat and, and saturated fats. And this person was confused because this was this has been in all the news media. Have you seen this study? And they're like, oh, and they're acting like, oh, this is just a known fact. And it's it's so well known. We made a calculator and you can actually slide the little buttons around. I eat this much veg or I eat this much fruit. And it'll tell you how many years you're going to add to your life. Here's the problem with that. This news article and, and this research study is based 100% on observational research, which at, when it's done very, very well, it can show a possible association. It can never show causation. So uh, this is a daydream. Okay. This is somebody's, this is, this is literally made up crap. Okay. They make it look very official. It's on all the news channels and there's an actual calculator on the internet. You can go and put in how much you eat and figure out how many years longer you're going to live. But it's, there's not a single control trial in human beings in that research. It's all observational data based on food frequency questionnaires. People lie on questionnaires. Uh, the, who made up the questions? Questions can be slanted to uh, entice people to give a certain answer. This is not real science. This is not real research. It doesn't show anything whatsoever, except that the powers that be currently want you to eat a highly processed plant-based diet full of beans, full of grains, full of sugar, full of vegetable seed oils. This is something I call a, a prisoner diet or a slave diet because it will keep you from starving to death. It, it will keep your belly relatively full as long as you eat every two to four hours with snacks in between, you, you, you can get by on that. But if your goal is to improve your health, indeed, if your goal is to optimize your health, 
then you've got to eat a proper human diet. You can't be eating uh, a prisoner diet, a slave diet, a soldier diet, basically just to keep you alive and keep you just healthy enough so you can limp to work, work your eight hours, and then limp back home and crash on the couch. That's no kind of life. And if that's how your life currently is, there is a better way, I promise you. And it's not, it's not the way of that new study. Let's see. Eldon Scott says, any knowledge of benefits of fasting for amyloidosis? Mother 64 has been diagnosed of waiting on heart tests, but uh, is in her blood and lungs, but no trace in the bone marrow. Any insight? Yeah. So she's going to be able to slow down the progression and decrease the severity of her symptoms by eating a proper human diet. It is the most uninflammatory diet. It is not going to spike her insulin or muck up her other hormones. That's what you want to do. Thanks for the super chat, Eldon. All right. Pro Concrete Coatings lost 10 pounds in, in 10 weeks has lost 28 pounds with keto and intermittent fasting. Yep. And I'm happy to talk about medications. I'm happy to talk about medical conditions. Uh, JL says, is keto good for low ejection fraction and heart failure? So uh, let's, tell you, let's take heart attacks, for, ex for example. Um, when we were eating a proper human diet, heart attacks just weren't a thing. Even back in the, in the 1910s and 1920s, heart attacks were so rare. Heart failure was so rare that there might be one page about it in a medical textbook. And now uh, decreased ejection fraction, heart failure, heart attack, all kinds of heart conditions are so common that now we have entire 1,000 page medical textbooks written about just heart diseases. So I would eat a diet that is not the modern diet. Karen Lee says, why would big companies want us to eat a prisoner diet? Great question, Karen. So what are the cheapest three ingredients to make food out of? Grains, rice, wheat, oats, and corn. Vegetable seed oils, soybean oil, canola oil, sunflower, safflower, corn oil, and sugar. Those things are all subsidized, at least in the United States. The big food manufacturers essentially get those for free. And from those, they can have a 1,000% markup of profit on the products that will sit on the shelf for five years. Nothing will eat them. Bacteria won't eat it. The, riot, the, the mice won't even eat it. But human beings buy it every day and pay their hard-earned money for it. Uh, real food is meat and eggs and some veg, and some nuts, and uh, maybe some berries. That's a real human diet, right? That has, those are, those things are nutrient dense. Those things are low in carbohydrates. And so if you eat the, the latest thing from Kellogg's, or the latest thing from Post, or Pillsbury, you're going to get a blood sugar spike and an insulin spike. You're going to feel full for about an hour, maybe two, and then you're going to be hungry again. Now, do you see how the big food manufacturers profit if you get hungry every two hours? Think about that. I mean, if I were going to make a food that I can make the most profit on, I would use the cheapest shit I can find to make it. But then I would also engineer it so that you're hungry again two hours after you ate it. So you eat some more. That's a good profit model. The board of directors and the shareholders love that profit model. You know who doesn't love that profit model? Your body and your brain. They don't love that. And that's why uh, so many of us today in modern society are so sick and so fat and so fatigued and so depressed is because we are putting this literal crap in our bodies and expecting some miraculous result to occur. So Karen Lee, they do it to make thousand percent markups of profit. They do it so you'll be hungry again in, in two hours. So then you'll eat some more of the prisoner diet, the slave diet. They don't care about your health. That is not part of their uh, mandate. Their mandate is to make profits for the shareholders. And if they have to do that at the expense of your health, they'll do that. And I think once some hungry young assistant district attorney files a class action lawsuit against some of the big food manufacturers, and, and there's this thing called discovery where they get to get a copy of everything, all the files, all the studies that were never published. They get a copy of everything. 
even the things that that Kellogg's and or Post uh, or General Mills would never want to see the light of day. That DA gets a he gets a copy of that, and all that stuff comes to light. And I think when that happens, and that will happen in the next three to five years, there'll be a big class action lawsuit because people are getting so sick. People are, are literally disabled every day because of the diet that they eat. Somebody's going to take that case. And even if they don't win it, even if it drags out in court for 25 years, the big food manufacturers don't want that case because they know then that attorney gets discovery and gets a copy of everything they've got on file. And that's when the cheese will get binding, as my grandfather used to say. Uh, let's see. Let me answer some. Trucking with diabetes says food companies are the new cigarette companies, cheap and addictive. Trucking with diabetes, thanks for the super chat. And you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of the tobacco companies, when they saw the writing on the wall, they started buying big food companies. 100%. Look it up. They, and so the big food manufacturers are now using the tobacco playbook. They got a copy when the big tobacco company bought the big food company. They've got a they got a playbook. Exactly. How do we make it addictive? How do we make it where, you know, as cheap as possible? It doesn't kill anybody quickly. So nobody can really sue for for damages because you kill my mama overnight. It's just, it, you know, it's a little dangerous. Not bad. But over the years, it'll add up. But nobody's going to ever make that connection. That's exactly the playbook they're using trucking with diabetes. Kelton Houston says, is it all right to primarily eat pork for a few days? I like beef, but sometimes I have periods where I eat more pork than beef. I stick to ketovore rules. So I think pork is fine. I think chicken is fine. They do have a higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratio than ruminants. There's no doubt about that. But if you have eliminated all the vegetable oils from your diet, then your intake of omega three, uh, omega omega six toxic vegetable oils is going to be so low that the little bit of extra omega six fatty acids you're going to get from pork or chicken, I think for the vast majority of people, it doesn't matter. Now there is this thing called a normal distribution curve, right? And so there may be some people over on this end of the curve who the there's too many omega sixes and they get inflammation from pork and chicken. And, but the vast majority of people, I think, can eat it at least occasionally, and they do just fine. Good question. I got that one. Let's make sure I'm getting all my questions answered here. Hey, Denise, thanks for the super chat. Thank you very much. Rob says, can pork products such as ham be included on the beef, butter, bacon, and egg diet? If not, why not? So most cuts of pork are very, very lean. They're high protein, moderate to low fat. And most people on triple B and E diet, which is beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Yes, that's a real diet. And yes, you can reap amazing health benefits from that. The, it's beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And the reason I included bacon is because bacon has a one-to-one -one fat to protein ratio, which is where most people feel best. Not everyone. Some people need higher fat than that. If so, you can cook your bacon in butter or bacon grease and get even more fat. But uh, so most pork, pork products are too, they're low in fat. Most chicken products, especially skinless chicken, doesn't have enough fat in it to be satiating enough for you to be able to eat that one meal a day OMAD or two meals a day TMAD. That's why. Good question. Sam's Gecko says, when taking electrolytes, is overdosing on potassium serious? Is it a big worry? So if you have normal kidney function, and you get a little bit too much magnesium or potassium or sodium or chloride in your diet, do you know what's going to happen? Who knows? You're going to urinate it out. You're going to pee it out. It, your body's like, duh, I've been doing this for a million years. That's easy. Now, if you sat down with a whole pack of Redmond's Relight powders and just ate the whole thing with a spoon, the whole entire container, uh, that might be a problem. You might have a uh, you might get too much potassium or magnesium or sodium or chloride in that case. But I'm talking about just regular uses, using it according to the directions. And if you have normal kidney function, that is never going to be a problem. Okay. Uh, oh, I got a vegan over on TikTok says meat is a class one carcinogen. Bacon fumes are carcinogenic. Yeah. See, and, and I know you're well-meaning. You're trying to help people who are listening to me because you think I'm giving bad information. 
But here's the problem with that. My vegan friend, my vegan colleague, all of that information, and there's only like three studies that the World Health Organization used to declare bacon a class one car carcinogen. It's all observational data. There's not a single research study that shows that eating bacon causes cancer. There is no such study on the planet. And that may surprise you. You may be like, no, I heard a vegan influencer say that bacon caused cancer. Mm -mm. There was a very weak possible association between bacon and increased cancer risk in, in the observational study based on food frequency questionnaires. Get it? You see how this works? But then they can demonize bacon. Oh, the World Health Organization says it causes cancer. But it's that's never been proven. That's never been shown. The, even the association in the observational research is like a 1.18, which is almost background noise. So the observational research that we used back in the day to, de to decide that, that smoking cigarettes increases your chance of cancer, it had a, a risk ratio of like 20 or 30, 2-0, 3-0, big, big, big association. Bacon and cancer, 1.18. It, it literally is meaningless. It's, it's like the static when you get in between two radio stations. It doesn't mean anything. Okay, good question. Keisha says, how many carbs, protein, and fat for the ketogenic diet? Uh, so, Keisha, you want you want fat to be about 70% of your intake. You want carbohydrates to be about 5% of your intake. Uh, and, and then the rest you're going to fill with protein. And you want to always eat a protein-adequate diet. But many people do much better on a high-fat, moderate-protein diet. Some few people do better on high-protein, moderate-fat. And either way, as long as you keep the carbohydrates very, very low, you win and I win. I don't care if you eat high protein, moderate fat or high fat, moderate protein. I don't care. Either way, you win because you're going to get healthier. And I win because you got healthier by doing something that I suggested you do. We both win. But now if you're going to eat a high carb diet like the PLOS study uh, with lots of legumes that are very inflammatory, uh, lots of fruits, which contain way too much fructose. If you're eating multiple servings a day, you're not, your health's not going to benefit. And you're not going to be happy with the, uh, with your results. Leona says my husband and five-year-old both diagnosed with alpha gal. What's the best way to add healthy fats when they cannot eat mammal products? So uh, Leona, they can still eat fish and shellfish and crustaceans. They can still eat all kinds of poultry right? They can eat chicken, turkey, duck, squab, all those things. Uh, virtually everybody with alpha-gal can eat those uh, animal proteins, right? And 99% of people with alpha-gal can still eat eggs. So there's plenty of protein options. That's number one. Number two, Leona, is that alpha-gal from a tick bite is temporary. Most people, it only the, the reaction only lasts from three to six months, and then it wears off and goes away. It's not permanent. And then they can go back to eating a proper human diet with lots of ruminant meat. Good question. All right. Let's see. Let's get something over here on Instagram. Uh, v Baldwin says, thoughts on raw A2 dairy, cheese or raw goat milk? So drinking liquid dairy is very good for human beings as long as they're five years of age or under. Okay. After that, you start to lose two, uh, two thirds to three quarters of human beings on the planet start to lose their ability to break down and utilize lactose. They become lactose intolerant. That's not a rare thing. That's the, that's normal. That's the standard. Uh, some folks with, with my DNA heritage, we lived with um, bovines, at the, in the far north for so long and drank milk for so long that we've actually now have a gene defect that allows us to keep utilizing liquid dairy as adults. Now, this is still not without risk and not without drawbacks. Uh, many, many people still have inflammation from the, the protein. A2 dairy is less inflammatory for most people than A1. 
dairy protein. But but some people, even A2 protein, I think that raw uh, dairy, raw milk, raw goat's milk is less bad than pasteurized milk from the super, supermarket. Definitely less bad than homogenized uh, liquid milk from the from the supermarket. The homogenation just screws up the, the fats, the fatty acids and the globules. It really messes them up. And so, uh, yeah, if you're under five years of age, you're, you're going to benefit, especially from raw A2 dairy, goat's milk. But if you're an adult, then odds are, even though you may not feel any inflammation directly after you drink milk, there's some inflammation somewhere in your body because you have lost, at least partially lost the ability to digest and break down lactose. And the proteins in bovine milk are very different from the proteins in human breast milk. Um, cow's milk is made for baby cows. The vegans are right about that. They're hundred percent right about that. That is not a, a, a healthy ancestrally appropriate food for adult human beings. Good question. Uh, fully laden swallow says I've got Hashimoto's. What would be the optimum iodine levels? Thank you as always. So I, with Hashimoto's, every human on the planet needs iodine without exception. Even if you have thyroid cancer, hyperthyroidism, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, you still need iodine every day in your diet. Now, it's re really hard. You can't check a serum iodine. You're not going to get any kind of usable number from that because your body controls your iodine levels very tightly. The only way to really check, really, is to do a 24-hour urine collection for iodine. And that's going to give you a usable number, but you got to collect all your urine for 24 full hours. And then the doctors even got to know how to order the test, which most doctors don't. My advice is to make sure you're eating the iodine rich foods I talk about in my YouTube video. And if you don't think, if you don't like any of those, then use an iodine replacement product like Lugol's 2% iodine. Do one drop a day. That'll give you 1000 micrograms, give or take a day. And if you get too much, what are you going to do? Going to urinate it out, right? But that's not going to be too much for most people. Good question. Cherry says, my son became allergic to beef. How does that happen? He may have alpha gal from a tick bite. This happens sometimes. It's temporary. It's going to last a few months and it's going to go away. Uh, it is vanishing, vanishingly rare for a human being to have a true beef allergy. Uh, very often it's it's an allergy to one of the preservatives or some other crap that they've added to the beef. But it's it's virtually unheard of for a human being to have a true beef allergy. Good question. All right. Dale Harmon says, Dr. Barry, you look like a lumberjack. Well, that's that's funny because I've been clearing out around our pond. I cut down a few trees today. So I kind of was a lumberjack today. Uh Somebody thinks Alpha Gal's man-made. I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I did my chainsaw workout today, getting stuff done. That's exactly right. Linda says, I'm type 2 diabetic and hypoglycemic. How do I stay on keto and not have my blood sugar drop to 45? So, Linda, if you're on any... Uh, type 2 diabetes medications, you may, you're may you going to have to see your doctor and say, hey, I'm going to start eating low carb. You're going to have to decrease, especially if you're injecting insulin. You'll have to, uh, people on with type 2 diabetes who are injecting insulin, they can stop the insulin in literally days to weeks. Get off the insulin. Never need it again, eating low carb, okay? Uh, Glibiride, gl glipizide, glimipiride, these all work for type 2 diabetes by causing your pancreas to secrete more insulin. And if, so if you're taking one of those medicines and you eat low carb, that's liable to drop your blood sugar too low. You're going to have to talk to your doctor and get off that medicine. Glucophage or metformin or berberine, they, they don't have this hypoglycemic side effect. So that's why many people keep taking their, their glucophage or their metformin or berberine, which is a supplement. They keep taking that because it helps with glucose and insulin metabolism, but it, there's no danger of having a low blood sugar episode. Uh, you just keep slowly lowering the carbs, Linda, talk to your doctor and say, hey, I'm doing low carb. You got to get me off uh, this medication. Now, let's see what's going on. 
Does eating lots of beef put you at risk of getting beef tapeworm ever after 85 cents? Uh, I've never, uh, I've seen over 25,000 unique patients in my over two decades of practice. I've never seen a, seen a single person with a beef tapeworm. Never, never read a case report to my knowledge of someone getting a tapeworm from beef. Um, I, you may have heard that from somewhere, but I've, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Eat your beef. Let's see what else we've got here. How do you guys like my mug? Nisha got this for me. Christopher says, I have not been diagnosed with hemochromatosis, but my dad has it, and my ferritin is very high, around 650. Should I stay away from eating offal, especially liver? So, Chris, Christopher, the first thing you should do is go see your doctor and, have, and be formally tested for hemochromatosis. There's a, a set of tests. If your doctor doesn't know how to do it, it's not just checking a ferritin. That's not how you do it. If your doctor doesn't know how, go see a hematologist, which is a blood specialist, and they will do the full panel, and they can tell you definitively, yes or no, you have hemochromatosis or you do not. Once you have that answer, then you'll know. But as far as the ferritin being high, there are many, many, many things that can cause your ferritin level to be elevated that have nothing to do with hemochromatosis. I'm actually compiling the notes and research for a YouTube video about elevated ferritin right now. And I'll be making that in a few weeks, so stay tuned. If you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, do that so that when I post that video, you'll get a notification. Yeah, if it's a tapeworm, you definitely see the worm. I've never had tapeworms, but Granny Berry had tapeworms when she was a girl. And from her rather vivid description of what it's like to have tapeworms, when you poop, there is no doubt that you have tapeworms. It is quite obvious coming from a lady I trust and who has had firsthand experience with having tapeworms. Mary Lou likes my mug. Thank you, Mary Lou. I've got some good decaf coffee in this. I love coffee so much. It's a problem. I don't know why I love it so much. Everybody on Instagram's re requesting to go live with me. I can't do that. I'm live on three platforms, or I might do that. Next time I'm live on IG, ask me again. Uh, Krumenaker says, is there a health benefit to eating a whole lemon? No. There is no magical health benefits from eating a whole lemon or from drinking lots of apple cider vinegar or from drinking lots of celery juice. These magical things that you hear about on the Internet are just people trying to make a name for themselves. Just the people trying to sell a product, sell a course, sell a, sell a book. There's no magic. OK, plants have many of medicinal properties. If you uh, like, for instance, the other day I saw a YouTube video about the wonderful, miraculous powers of drinking celery juice. And the person actually linked their research and I went and looked them all up because, you know, how I am. I'm kind of a, a nerd like that. All the research studies were about celery seed extract, which means they took thousands or millions of celery seeds, pressed them, and then got some tiny extract out of them. It had literally nothing to do with celery juice itself. Celery juice and celery seed extract are two very, very different things. Now, there may be some medicinal things in celery seed extract that we'll discover one day. We may be able to use those and get a, somebody can get a patent on it and sell it as a medicine. But celery juice? No. No, no, there's no magic. There's no magic in oatmeal. All these things, we, we get almost these religious beliefs about food. And it, there's, there's literally not a shred of evidence, research to support that. And there's no ancestral common sense physiology that, that you would go, oh, yeah, I could see how that, no, no, no. There's no physiology. There's no biochemistry. There's no ancestral record. And there's no meaningful research. It's bullshit. I'm sorry. I know. I know. It, it would be wonderful. It'd be lovely if these things were true, but they're not true. Eat your meat and eggs, plus or minus a little veg, plus or minus some nuts, plus or minus some berries. That is a proper human diet. Nancy Louise says, please help. My blood sugar is 369. 
Um, my EST is 369, ALT 309. My doctor just said to lose weight and juice. Uh, Nancy, if you want to make your fatty liver, which you definitely have, if you want to make your fatty liver and your type 2 diabetes worse, then drink lots of fruit juice. That will 100% make your fatty liver worse. Your doctor just gave you malpractice level bad advice. If you juice and just drink the juice from fruits or even vegetables, your blood sugar is going to spike to 469 and your, your fatty liver is going to get even worse. Do not do that. I have videos on this YouTube channel, on my YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Ken Berry. And I've got videos, multiple videos on type 2 diabetes, Nancy Louise, which you definitely have. And multiple videos on how to reverse type 2 diabetes and on how to reverse fatty liver, which you most definitely have, Nancy Louise, your life hangs in the balance. Go watch my videos as soon as this live is over. And I, I, I'm telling you, I know he's your doctor and I know you trust him. And I know he may have been your doctor for 10 years, but lose weight. Yeah. Yeah. But how are you going to lose weight drinking juice, Nancy? Terrible advice. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Amy says, you were my doctor for 10 years, and I need you to come back. Oh, Amy, I'm not seeing another doctor. By the way, I've lost 50 pounds, wiped out high blood pressure meds, and reversed prediabetes, thanks to your advice. Yay. Amy Parsons, thank you so much for that. Thanks for the super chat. Andrea, or Andrea, says, can you do a video on Raynaud's syndrome? I have been keto for one year and still have symptoms. Uh, yes. Now, Andrea, if you still smoke, if you still use any nicotine product, so maybe you quit smoking and now you're vaping, nicotine still causes vasoconstriction in the tiny arteries of your fingers and your toes. On each side of your finger, you got a tiny artery here and a tiny artery here on each one of your 10 fingers and on each one of your 10 toes. And when you smoke tobacco, vape tobacco, dip tobacco, doesn't matter, you're going to have constriction. Because people with Raynaud's, they, their, their arteries are very, they have itchy trigger fingers. They'll constrict if there's any kind of coldness or any kind of nicotine. Some few people, caffeine will cause it as well. But you've been keto for a year. That's a great start. If I were you, Andrea, I would try and get off all nicotine, 100%, and maybe all caffeine, and try 90 days of beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And you may be surprised at how much better your Raynaud's is. Good question. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, what do we got on TikTok? Oh, somebody asked me a question and I missed it. Where am I originally from? From TikTok. I am from Hohenwald, Tennessee. Now, metropolitan Hohenwald, not the not the, the small town. Yeah, no, it's literally, I think the whole county probably has 16,000 people in it. Uh, grew up there. Uh, got the heck out of there. Went to Murfreesboro. Got a bachelor's degree in animal science uh, with a, with a minor in psychology and biochemistry, and then went to medical school in Memphis at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, and then did my residency training at St. Francis Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And then I came uh, all that to come back to another small town, Camden, Tennessee, where I started my practice and practice for. 20 years. Still going, still going. Our clinic burned down, but I still have a, I still have a very small private practice where I see a few people. And um, most of my time I spend on social media trying to teach you guys how to reverse things like type two diabetes and fatty liver and obesity. Yeah. You don't have to smoke to have run Raynaud's. Raynaud's is probably a genetic predisposition to have, uh, are arteries that are just very likely the least bit of stimulus they'll constrict. And then you'll have the white finger, which later turns red and painful, but smoking definitely makes it much, much worse. Whoa, whoa, these are going by really fast. Steven says, hello, Dr. Barry, keto five months, went from 270 pounds down to 202 pounds. Five months. What do you guys think about that? Give Steven all the thumbs and all the hearts. Uh, his A1C went from 8.1 down to 5.8. His triglycerides went from 327 down to 202. His HDL went up from 35 to 38. 
how do I get my HDL up higher? Plus weight loss has stalled. So uh, obviously, Stephen, keto has done great things for you. It might be time for you to shift down a gear and go to ketovore. Now, if you don't know exactly what that is, I've got YouTube uh, videos about the ketovore diet. And my wife, Nisha, has two or three videos on the ketovore diet. Uh, she's better looking than me. So maybe go to Nisha Loves It on YouTube and watch her ketovore videos. But it's basically a very, very meat heavy keto where you try to limit your total carbohydrates to 10 or less per day. Because even though you've improved your A1C, you no longer have type 2 diabetes, Stephen. You reverse that with keto, but you still got prediabetes. And so it may just be a matter of time before you reverse that with keto, or you can step down to ketovore. Or you can go all the way and go carnivore for 90 days, and then you'll no longer have prediabetes. You'll reverse that as well. Your triglycerides are better, but they're not under 150, which is where we want them. Your HDL is better, but it's not up above 40, uh, 45 where we need to see it. So in order to get your HDL up higher, you're going to eat more fatty red meat, more fatty ruminant meat, and you're going to lift heavy things, and you're going to cut the carb intake even more. If you've been counting net carbs for your health, you need to start counting total carbohydrates. Uh, stop eating all the keto cookies, cakes, pies, candy, shakes, smoothies, all that stuff is junk food. Okay. It's less bad than the high carb junk food, but it's still junk food. Nonetheless, you need to be eating real whole one ingredient ancestrally appropriate foods. Okay. And in another three months, you will have completely reversed your type 2 diabetes, completely reversed your hypertriglyceridemia, uh, and you'll be well on your way to, re you'll completely have reversed your morbid obesity. 202 pounds, is that's that's so much better than 270. You're not quite there yet. I know you got to go. Keep going. You're going to get there. Okay, well done. Well done. Brian C., thanks for the super chat and the thumbs up. Uh Tia says, do you think it's possible for dairy to mess up my hormones? Tia, I do not think it's possible for butter or ghee to mess up your hormones. Uh, it's probably not possible for heavy cream or double cream to mess up your hormones. But drinking milk d definitely could mess up your hormones, 100%. Uh, cows naturally put hormones in their milk. That's not up for debate. That's pretty much known. There's all kinds of hormones in there. Plus, the lactose is going to spike your blood sugar, which is going to spike your insulin, and that is going to cause other hormones to deviate from their optimal spot. Okay, and then for many people, the the protein in in milk is much too inflammatory, and it will cause inflammation either in the joints, it'll cause inflammation in the gut or the skin. Some people, it's mental. Their their mood. Their they actually get uh, a clinical depression if they drink too much liquid dairy. For some people, cheese does not have this effect because a microbe has eaten up all the sugar and bent the protein. For so for some people, real cheese is is uninflammatory enough that it doesn't bother them, doesn't bother their hormones. But for some of us, including me, if I eat too much cheese. I'll start to, to gain weight in the middle, and I can tell my hormones are not right where they need to be. Cheese has to be an occasional dessert for me, and maybe for you too, Tia. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, Carrie's in the same ex exact boat as I am. Carrie says, I got rid of drinking milk, and my sinus issues went away. 100% me too. I, when I was growing up, I was I was a high school. I played football. I played baseball, played basketball. And I thought that I had to drink lots of milk so I could be big and strong. And so I was I would drink a gallon a day of 2% milk because I thought that was a superfood. And I literally had a snotty nose every day from, from the age of three until the age of 18 when I went to college and didn't have a fridge in my dorm room, so I couldn't drink milk constantly. And my allergies got better. I was like, that's weird. I was too young and dumb then to understand. But now looking back, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, if I if I even too much heavy cream for me, I'll start to get phlegm. I'll start to get a little congested. Uh, liquid dairy is not for adult humans. It's just not. Even breast milk. There's there's some bros out there who lift weights and they're trying to to you know hit personal records or 
or be a bodybuilder on stage drinking human breast milk. That's not some miraculous thing. It will make you grow uh, muscles. It will make you also grow fat. It will also make you grow a fatty liver. It will also make you inflamed. It will make you burn out years before you would have otherwise. Okay. So uh, breast milk is for babies. Gentlemen, stop drinking it. It's not for you. Boink 800 says the vegan diet kills people. Yeah, but Boink, it kills them so slowly. And it keeps them so weak and, and, and so just pervasive brain fog that they, it never really occurs to them or dawns on them what's really going on. All right. Let's see what's going on. Kim Lewis says, do you have any tips not to cheat on keto? I always start craving sweets at around five. Yeah. So Kim is a sugar addict, just like I am. Uh, if you're if you're a sugar addict, a carb addict, raise your hand right now and say, I, repeat your name, am a sugar addict. And go do that and look in the mirror and say that. Because when you do that, then you're like, oh, okay. It's okay. I've admitted it to myself. Now I can act on it. So the, the key things that really helped me, Kim, is to stay out of the kitchen and stay away from food. Uh, that helps me a lot. So when I'm out working in the woods, I don't even think about food. I came in today and I broke my fast at 4.30 with two pounds of ground beef and a can of sardines with zero carb mustard. And what else did I eat? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Some leftover steak. That's what I, that's what I broke my, and I may eat a second time tonight or I may not. Also, Kim, when you do eat a keto meal, eat until you're comfortably stuffed. So many people come to keto and, and they think they should still portion control. If you do that, you're not going to eat enough. You may not get enough protein. You may not get all your vitamins and minerals and fatty acids by doing that. But also, you're not going to be completely satiated. And so if some little temptation does come up, now not only are you fighting the addiction, but you're also fighting hunger as well. And when you're fighting those two at the same time, most of the time you're going to lose. So you got to eat until you're comfortably stuffed on keto. That helps a lot. Make sure you're getting plenty of fat, plenty of protein. And otherwise, stay away from, stay out of the kitchen. Stay away from the food if you can. That's what helps me. Larry says, is diatomaceous earth okay to use in your diet? Yeah, I've actually read quite a bit about diatomaceous earth, Larry. Uh, if, if you do have any parasites, that's going to get rid of them. You always want to make sure you got to you use a food grade diatomaceous earth. Don't buy it at, at Lowe's or Home Depot and ingest it because that's, that's no bueno. But if you've got a food grade diatomaceous earth, then it's okay. It's not going to hurt you to eat it. It may not help you at all, but it's not going to hurt you either. Okay. Well, there was a good question. Where'd that go? Dang it. I hate it when they jump like that. ST0720. Come on, guys. You got to get a better handle than that. <laughs> I, I can't quit Mountain Dew, but I love the carnivore diet. How do I quit pop? I actually have a video on this YouTube channel. It might be a short. I think it's a short on how I quit. I used to be addicted to diet Mountain Dew or, or diet Pepsi either or diet Dr. Pepper. I had one of those in my hand at all times for the first nine years of my medical practice, maybe longer. But I, even though they're sugar-free, that's that's less bad. But still, they're made by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Do you really think they give a damn about your long-term health? Now, they're not going to kill you overnight because you'd sue them. Your family would sue them. But if they do a little bit of harm to you that adds up and 30 years later you have a problem, you have cancer or whatever, do you think they really care about that? No, I don't trust Coca-Cola and Pepsi with my health. And so I'm like, I got to quit this. So what I would, I started doing was mixing Diet Mountain Dew half and half with uh, sparkling water like San Pellegrino or Topo Chico or Perrier. And when you do that, the, it still tastes pretty much the same, but you're getting half the amount. And I did that for a week or two. Then I started cutting, cutting it by two thirds. And then I cut it some more. And finally, I just said to hell with it. And now I just drink sparkling water. And coffee. I think Nisha Berry just got home. 
She's bringing me some crab legs from the restaurant. Hey, baby. You brought me flowers, too? Aw. Come say hi to everybody. <gasps> Becky Berry. You got me some crabs? Thank you so much. Aw. So sweet. I'm the sweetest. Look at this outfit. And baby bump update. Let's see the baby bump. She's there. Come closer for, for the Instagram. There you go. <laughs> oh, there's, oh, 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 hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. These are from the grocery store. That's, those are pretty. Are they? Not much smell, but they're pretty. Well, Thank you, Co-Create, for the super chat. Let me make sure I've got everybody here. Thank you, Vinger. Thank you, Linda. Danielle says, pre-diabetic, should I get metformin? Heard it helps with aging as well. A uh, lot of uh, longevity researchers believe it, it it does help with longevity and a life extension. I actually took it for a few years just for that very purpose. But the re basically, metformin is a keto mimicking medication, which is a fasting mimicking diet. So rather than take metformin, I thought I'll just do keto and fast. This is Loki, one of our rescue cats. Hi, Loki. How you doing? I think Loki's trying to give me a hint. You see Loki over there on TikTok? See my cat? <laughs> she just decided to join. I don't know. So, yes, uh, Danielle, as, un, while, un, until you reverse pre-diabetes, you probably continue the metformin. Yeah, it's going to help control the glucose and insulin metabolism a little. A little. A little. It's not going to allow you to cheat, but it will help a little. Okay. Uh, but when you, when you have a normal A1C, which is under 5.7, you can stop the metformin, uh, and keep reading the research. I am currently unimpressed with the research on metformin, uh, and longevity or life extension, but some people really believe it's going to help and they take it every day. Vape chief gaming says diagnose, diagnose type two in December with a 320 blood sugar. I'm now taking metformin in Genuvia, changed diet with an average blood sugar of 104 and on strict carnivore for three weeks, now seeing 140s. So uh, what you're going to do, Vape Chief, is you're going to keep on, keep on carnivore or keto, either one, doesn't matter, but I'd keep going carnivore for 90 days and then get your A1C rechecked because many carnivores will have a higher blood sugar that looks too high. But when you get the A1C check, that tells tells the true tale, which is that physiologically induced blood sugar that your liver made, that's not that's not pathological. That's physiological. But if you eat enough carbohydrates to spike your blood sugar to 140, that's pathology. That's going to cause glycation, inflammation, and damage. Okay. You're probably you haven't completely reversed your type two. So you still have hyperinsulinemia. And so you're still going to have blood sugar that's wacky and up and down and stuff. Uh, the Genuvia will be the first medicine that you stop. Stay on the metformin until you have a normal A1C and, and keep the carbs as close to zero as you can get them. And you'll no longer be a type two in a, in a few months. Marquita, I love cheese, but regular cheese breaks me out. Yep. And for many people, this is this is their body telling them this is causing inflammation. If they eat too much cheese, they get zits. Nisha, Nisha Salas hyphen bearing. If she eats too much cheese or uses too much heavy cream, old faithful right here comes and says, Hey, you're eating too much dairy. You need to cut back. And when she stops the dairy, her her face clears up and she's got the, the skin as smooth as Beckett's bottom. Uh vegan cheese is made of vegetable seed oils. I would not ever eat vegan cheese. If I were if I were starving to death, I would have to starve for many days before I would eat vegan cheese. Um, try to get the hardest, most aged cheese you can get, like chia, like Parmesan, like uh, cheddar, really hard cheeses. So if you threw a hunk of it at somebody, they'd have a knot. They'd have to go to the ER. No soft, soft cheese is always going to be more likely to cause breakouts like that because it's not fermented and it's not acted on by the microbe for long enough to bend the proteins. Good question. Uh, L. Jones, I have a condition where I have a lack of acid in my stomach. 
when I eat really unhealthy food. So you know the solution to that, L. Jones? I believe this has something to do with the antibiotics I had to take for a long period of time. Do you have any help, please? Yeah, almost certainly, L. Jones, you are not. Uh, you do not lack stomach acid. The only way you lack stomach acid is if you're taking an acid-blocking medication. Uh, this is a very common thing that naturopaths love to tell people, oh, you're not making enough stomach acid, therefore you need all these supplements. Uh, the only way to know for a fact that someone's not making enough stomach acid is if you do an EGD and put a pH meter in their stomach. Now, if you've had that done and it said your pH was low, I mean, it was high, that was not adequate, then okay. There are a few exquisitely rare conditions where you don't make enough stomach acid, but they're literally one in a million. And you probably ain't that one, L. Jones. So uh, stop eating unhealthy food. Eat your meat and eggs. If you're taking an acid blocker, slowly wean off that. You're going to make plenty of stomach acid. Got that one. Thank you, Yinny. Alejandro says, I can't stop drinking Pepsi or Coke but I can only take Pepsi Black or Coke Zero. Question, are they bad for keto and fasting? They're not necessarily bad for, for keto or for fasting, but they're made by Coke and Pepsi. I don't trust them. If you trust them with your life and with your future health and your longevity, then keep drinking them. Otherwise, start cutting them at least half and half. Dilute them half and half with a sparkling water. If nothing else, club soda. You, I promise you, if you take a Coke, uh, a Coke Zero or a Pepsi Black and you pour half Coke Zero and half Club Soda or San Pellegrino or Tupel Chico, it tastes 99% the same. And you just cut your exposure to whatever might be in the Coke or Pepsi in half. Why would you not do that? And then eventually you can get completely off of them because I don't really like supporting Coke and Pepsi. Uh, and the way, I mean, you need to read a little bit about what they've done to, to cities' water supplies and whole states and whole countries' water supplies so that they can make water to sell, to sell for a profit while farmers don't have enough water for their crops and for their livestock. Uh, Coke and Pepsi are no bueno. They are not, um, they're, they're, from a corporate standpoint, they are not a good entity. I am uncomfortable with a lot of the things they do. Rob, second day taking keto chow mineral drops. I had bad stomach cramps. A few days later happened again. Is this normal? What is the recommended daily dosage? Rob, the recommended daily amount of keto chow's mineral drops, which I helped to design, is on the bottle. That tells me you didn't read the ingredients list. You didn't read the label. Anytime you put something in your face hole that ha comes in a container and has a label, it is your job as the steward of your own health to read the damn label. Even if I des help design it, you still read the label. It's on there, Rob. It tells you how much to take. You, however much you've been taking, take, cut it in half. Take a half dose and you'll be fine. Thanks, Venger, for the super chat. I'm going to wrap this up now that the family's home is home, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Uh, this will be available for replay on YouTube and on my Instagram page if, if you missed part of it or if you're on TikTok right now. TikTok doesn't currently save it. So go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and you can watch this thing in its entirety if you join late, or it'll be on my uh IGTV as well, right? Okay, thanks for your for hanging out with me, guys. See you next time. All right. Thanks, TikTok, for.